Profiling PowerShell Tools. Hi, this is Jakob. You might know me as the maintainer of the Pester module. This is my Twitter, so if you want to reach out, then do so after the talk, or if you see this video later, then my DMs are open, so you can just reach out to me and we can talk about what you saw and if you can help in some way. So today I will be talking about profiling PowerShell scripts and modules. And uh, I got into this field when I tried to optimize the performance of Pester 5. I was looking at all the current uh, solutions that are out there and I will be talking about them. And then I will be talking about what are they lacking, how to improve it, and what are my solutions to this problem. So in the agenda it says, this is not talk about MeasureScript, but it kind of is. MeasureScript, if you don't know, is a module that uh, IS reset me or Matthias Jessen adopted and uh, improved it and made it PS profiler. And he has this awesome talk that I really recommend you to watch. And it summarizes measure script like this. So first there was measure command and it just tells you, well, it's all slow. Then you have measure script, which is the baseline for PS profiler. And it tells you those specific lines are slow. Then the PS Profiler, the module that Matthias wrote, it tells you these specific lines are slow and here is how their runtime performance evolved. But the problem with this is that you need to know which files are actually going to run. And you can only look at a single file at a time. So the PS Profiler of my dreams would be you execute some code and it tells you, hey, those are all the dependencies that were loaded and that run. And those are the commands in them that run. And here's the top 10, for example, that took most of the time. So that's something that I would want. And that would really help me uh, profile my scripts, especially if there is some module involved and so on. So first, let's have a look at uh, the current solution, measure script or PS profiler and its limitations. So first, uh, to show how it works, I have this script where everything is in the single file. So I have this hello, and I have this variable, and I have this condition, and start sleep, that will take one second. And then I have this write goodbye function, which also will uh, start sleep, or sleep for one second. So I go into my previous profiler, and this is the module that I downloaded from PowerShell Gallery, and I'm trying to use it to profile my script. So it will run for a while, because we have some sleeps, and then we'll, we will get this output, which for every line in the file prints out how many times the line was invoked and how long did it take. So for hello, it takes almost no time at all because it's just writing a string to the output. But then for the start sleep, we can see that it correctly measured that it took over one second to run the command, which is obvious because start sleep takes one second to run. Um, start sleep for one second should take one second to run. And then here, this didn't run at all because it's in the else part of the if, so it didn't take any time at all. But then we have this for each, and sometimes if you're just guessing what happened, why is the performance that slow, you might notice, hey, this is pretty slow way of adding an item into a collection, because every time we add an item, we actually copy the whole array and make it one item bigger and add the item inside of there. And that's pretty slow operation. But without looking at the data, you cannot really know if it's that slow or not. Because here you can see that it took how much, like nine or 94 milliseconds. But the most of the time in the script was actually consumed here in the get process. So that took over five seconds. So it has way bigger impact. And then we have this write goodbye which calls this function. And here, uh, maybe a bit unexpectedly, you can see that this took one second and this also took one second. But this is not really true because even though this line took one second to execute and this line took one second to execute, those didn't take two seconds to execute in total. It's just because this line is calling this function and this line is slow. So I understand why it's done this way, but in some cases it might be a bit confusing. But if we just have a self-contained file like this one, it's pretty awesome to use and uh, it gives you a lot of information that you otherwise wouldn't have. So if you have a simple script, this is definitely very, very useful. 
a command to have. But what if we have a more complicated script? So let's look at hello ps1, which has just the top part of the hello and goodbye script, and then it links to the goodbye script. Then in the goodbye script, we have the actual uh, iteration, and then we import a module and call write goodbye from a module. So it will actually sleep inside of that module. So looking at that, if we invoke it here, we will get less information than before because we will only get information about hello.ps1. And so here we can again see this took one second, this took no time at all, but this took six, almost seven seconds. And that doesn't really tell us what actually happened. But luckily the script is mentioned right here, so we can go on and we can invoke it. And in this case, it's really nice because it doesn't take any parameters. So it's really easy to just transition from that one call to the next one. So in here, we can again see the same information. So this took the majority of the time and then we called write goodbye. So now we don't really know where write goodbye came from, but we can kind of guess that it's coming from this greetings PSM. So we can try the same operation as we did before we can try just running the module as a file. But that, of course, won't work because here we are measuring just importing the function and no code is being run. So we see zeros. Uh, we can try something else. We can import a module and try calling uh, the function. But unfortunately, we only get information about that function call and we don't get the reason why it's so slow. So we don't get to see that this start sleep is actually causing the problem. So this is quite limited and I was looking into how to make it better. And to do that, I needed to understand how uh, measure script works. And so you probably need to understand it as well. So let me give you a quick overview. Uh, otherwise, definitely go and see the talk from Matthias. He has multiple of them and the explanation there is way, way better than this one. It takes more than an hour, not just, I don't know, half a minute. So say you have a code like this when you are calling start sleep inside of a for each. So what measure script sees is this is a code and it can analyze it through the parser and get what is called AST, abstract syntax tree. So pretty much it does this. It takes the code as a text and parses it and give, gets a list or actually a tree of items. And it navigates it and looks for the correct items. So for example, it looks for this command AST. And then when it has the command AST, it will go and it will put a stopwatch start and stopwatch stop after it. So if this code is executed, we will start a stopwatch, execute the command, and then we stop the stopwatch and that will give us the time that command took to execute. So it also keeps track of the stopwatches. So if I now go and run the code that would be instrumented because this is called instrumentation, we will see that the stopwatch should yield three seconds because we run it three times and sleeping three times for one second should give you three seconds. Um, to be honest, this is not the only information that uh, PS Profiler uh, keeps. It also keeps how many times um, this was invoked and how much each invocation took. So then you can look at what they call a timeline and see three invocations of this command, each taking one second, which would be three seconds in total. But there are some problems with this approach. So uh, ASD is a static analysis. And so it only sees the code, but it actually doesn't see the values that will be assigned to it or that will be created when the script runs. So if we had a script like this, where we are taking a morning script and an evening script and run it uh, based on when the script is called, we will see through ASD all of the things that should happen here, but we have no idea what this morning script will be. We have no idea what this evening script will be. And we also have no idea when it will be called. So we don't know if this one will be called or this one will be called. So we cannot go and instrument all of the code 
at the same time because we have no idea what the actual script will be when we run it. So looking at that and realizing that this is an inherent feature of the architecture, so it's how it works and there is really no thing that I can do about it to make it better, I was pretty bummed and I didn't really know how to progress. But then I noticed one more thing and that's this set ps debug that is a native PowerShell command. So if we call set ps debug and we specify trace one, we can see that it does this. It logs every line that's being invoked, actually every command, uh, to the screen. And it's not logging only from the Hello PS1, but it's also logging from Goodbye PS1, because if you remember, the iteration is done inside of Goodbye PS1. You can also see that it's logging from the module itself, and so we can see everything that happened when we invoked the hello script, which is pretty awesome news. So I looked at this and I thought, yeah, this is great. Is there an easy way of grabbing that info and adding some more? And it turns out there isn't. But if you open the source code for PowerShell, you can find that this is the method that's responsible for writing the information to the screen. And this method, will take a function context and a function context is an object that has an i script extent and an i script extent has all the information or almost all the information that we need so it has the file it has the start line number the start column number and it has the text so that shows us where exactly was this called from and then we can also get a timestamp simply by calling stopwatch get timestamp. So we have all the information that we need, which is pretty good. So then I just exposed this event on invoke command. So then I can do execution, com execution context invoke command and associate something to this action. And I'm also making sure that I'm not calling this action when I'm already calling this action to avoid getting stack overflow. And so what I can do with this is that I can hook to it from PowerShell and I can provide a callback and I can simply just save into a collection every time the sequence point is hit. So every time we are about to write to the screen the debug info, then I can save the information about what's being invoked. And because I'm doing it outside of this if, I can even do it without having the tracing enabled so it doesn't write anything to the screen the thing that i just need to have enabled is debugging so let's see how i'm using that so i wrote this uh first i compiled the version of powershell with my changes and we are actually running it the whole time and then i wrote this small module which is called ps tracer and this ps tracer doesn't do anything fancy it just has this collection that's called trace and this is the callback that happens every time a sequence point is hit. And so what happens here is that we start a stopwatch to log the overhead because the overhead on this uh, is actually pretty huge. And then we grab the extent and we grab the timestamp and we create this unified object that has all the information. So the path where it's coming from, the line number, the column number, the extent itself, then we have the timestamp when it happened, when the line was called. And then we have a duration and overhead that I'm setting to zero right now. And then we have this index, which is telling us where exactly in the collection this item is. So then when we just get a single item, and the collection we know where in the collection it was so for example by grabbing the previous item we can see where it was called from and this is very easy then i just add it into the collection and i take the time that it all took and add it to the overhead because as i said in the powershell callback this is pretty big like 8 to 10 milliseconds every time so because the overhead is so big, I actually implemented the same thing in C-sharp 
and I'm actually using it in here. But the code is totally the same as the other one. It's just faster because it's running directly in .NET. And then once I have that info, I simply set a breakpoint on the first line of this module to enable debugging, but not the tracing to the screen. And I register this callback and invoke the script block that was provided. And then once that's done, I unregister the callback so it doesn't trace anymore. And then I remove the breakpoint. And so that gives me the whole trace. Now I only have the timestamps from uh, the command. So it only tells me when did this command started. But to know how long it took, I need to look at the next one and see how long it took until the next one was reached. So this way I don't have to keep track of any stopwatches. I just need a list of timestamps. And because I know that the operations were running in sequence, I know that the time the first one took is until the next one started. So that's exactly what I'm just calculating here. And then I return the whole collection. So let's see it in action. So here I import my module called the hello ps1 and then I select the last 20 from that. So it's running for a bit and then I get a list of stuff that happened. So I was calling get process some idles. I'm calling write goodbye and then inside of the function I can see this. So that should be pretty much the same as what you see here because it is, it just uses a different way of reporting it and gives me the object so I can work with them further. So now that I have this trace, I can do some pretty amazing things with it. So I can select all the files that were executed. So you can see that we called hello, we called goodbye, we called greetings. I can also look at all the commands that were hit inside of hello ps1 and I can see the timestamp, which line it was, and so on. So those are all the reported items from this file. And uh, I already shown you how I'm calculating the, the duration, but here we can use it the same way, but just using the index, because the index is able to refer to the item inside of the collection. And so, to get the next one, I just need the index plus one. And I'm calculating it here for the greetings. And then I just subtract them and convert it from text. And I get that the line starts leap second one took one second. So that's pretty obvious. That's pretty much what we want. This is just a checkup. And then we can also from this gathered information about how many times uh, the line was hit. So for example, the line free and goodbye was hit 1000 times. So line free, this one get process name idle was called 1000 times as expected. And then um, we can also look at line two. So that's this line. And maybe a bit surprisingly, it was called 1002 times. So if you know how this works, it might not surprise you, but at first it definitely surprised me. And so the reason is that there are actually two commands on this line. So this one, that's the iteration, which will be run first time and that's accounting for one of the calls. And then every time we uh, iterate, we will go here and we will check if there is a next item and grab it. So we will actually call this 1000 times and then once more for checking if there is a next item and there won't be next item. So we just continue outside of the for each. So this is a good theory, but let's confirm it. So we can actually um, look at which column, column the command was called and we just group by that 
and then we just report it. So if we do that from the trace, you can see that this uh, I was called 1001 times and this one was called 1000, uh, just once. So that accounts for the 1002 times that we saw reported before. So this is pretty complicated code or well, it's not practical and I would definitely want something as what Matthias has in his PS profiler. So an overview of the whole file and overview of like the top commands that took most of the time. So I wrote another module for that and I just called it PS profiler 2 because I expect we will in some way merge it into the original PS profiler. And so I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm just uh, importing the PS profiler 2, calling the hello PS1. And then I'm pushing the trace that I got through this get profile. And so that's all done. And now I get the profiles. So I can again do a similar thing, look at all the profiles for all the files that were invoked and see which files were actually invoked. And then add the file um, in this case, not zero, but two, which will be hello. I want to look at the overview that is very similar to what Matthias has in PS profiler. So this already uh, shows me that this takes one second, but maybe a bit surprisingly, this shows very little time because in the previous output, we saw that this takes like six seconds, but in fact, this is reporting only how much time it took to invoke the script and move on to the next uh, move on to the next instruction. If you remember how we are calculating the duration, it's from this instruction to the next one. So once we entered the file, the timing here ended. And so this doesn't really say how long it took uh, for the goodbye to invoke. It says just how long it took to invoke it through this um, through this invocation operator, but not how long it took to return back into the script and continue. But we have more, so um, no, this shouldn't be goodbye, this should be goodbye, so this should be um, free. So here we can be looking at the goodbye, which is the one that we called. And then we can see that on line two, we have multiple commands. So line two, that's uh, index one. We can again look at the different commands and see how much time they contributed to the actual execution. So in this case, um, both of the times are pretty, pretty small. But in case we have a very slow iterator, like we would be calling out to an online service to get some data, this would be pretty useful information to have. And I actually have a demo for that. So here we have the demo for slow iterator. And here's the script. So in this script, I'm just asking um, GitHub API, show me the first page of pull requests that are on Pester and then write them to the screen. So if I do that, I can see that it writes to the screen. It shows me the incorrect file, I guess. Right, so we need to make this to make one. And then I'm able to see that this line took almost one second to invoke. And then I can look at each command as before and see that this contributed most of the time to the call because this is the one that took almost one second to call and not this one. And so in case where you have some pretty slow code in the iteration, you can debug it this way and see which different commands took how much time on that line. Now going back to this PS profiler, uh, we can also try to find out what are the most 
contrib uh, the commands that contribute the most to the overall time. And we can use this top 10 or top 10 average, top 10 duration and top 10 hit count properties on the final object. So if I run this, I over all of the calls in all of the files, I can see that this is the one that's most expensive. It contributes seven, almost 74% to the overall duration. It's hit 1000 times and it takes five seconds. The second one is the start sleep, which takes one second and is called just once. And then we have some other. So like this idols contributes a little bit of time as well. So it's not optimal. We could maybe rewrite it to using a list, but it's not a huge contribution. It's just 2% or one and a half percent. Then sometimes it might make sense to look at the average. So in the average, those are the ones that are the most expensive. So just for one call, they take one second just because we are sleeping there. But this also ranks pretty high. So even for 1000 calls, the average is still pretty big. So it's still a pretty expensive operation to make. Then we can look at the ones that took most of the time to invoke. And we can look at the ones that have the most hits. So once I've had that, I was pretty, pretty happy about what I have. And um, I think it's pretty awesome. So I took it and I went to the PowerShell repo and created a pull request. Actually, this is like a third approach that I took. Originally, I was just hacking it in and uh, just proposed, hey, this looks like something that would be pretty awesome to have. And so if you want, you can go and you can look at my original pull request, which spun some nice conversation. Uh, since then, we abandoned this exact idea and it's Ilya picking up um, this whole concept and rewriting it as he sees fit because he has a much bigger plans for it than I do. Um, hopefully this will be in PowerShell 7.2 preview one, which should be somewhere around January. So once I had all of this, I was pretty happy and I just wanted to see if first I can use the one that Ilya is producing to do the same stuff. So I created this demo and for that I need to run his version. So I'm just going to switch. So his version is a uh, version from his sources built locally and uh, uh, invoked the same way I was invoking just my version. And uh, what I'm doing here is that because each of those approaches has a slight difference in the objects that it produces, I'm unifying them to the same shape. So the get PS profile uh, or the profiler number two that I created um, can process them. And so that's this ugly code right here. So I'm taking the trace that is produced from the built in measure script command and uh, translating it into the form that I can understand with the PS profiler too. So here again, we invoke hello.ps1. It will take a little while to finish. And then we grab the trace, we convert all of the items that we got from it into the form that we understand. And then we go through the get profile to get the profile as we had before. And again, we can look at all the files that were in this run. And we want to again look at hello.ps1. So in this case, it would be the file on index two. And so again, we see the same profile. So no matter how you produce the trace, um, this module will be able to uh, convert it into this overview if you give it the right items in the right format, obviously. And so we can again look at the top 10, we get the same information just to verify that this works the same way. And uh, that's pretty awesome. But I can't really wait for PowerShell 7.2 preview one. 
And also, I want a solution that will work also in Windows PowerShell, like PowerShell 5. So I went further and I tried to, without actually changing the executable, because I cannot do that, the PowerShell 5 is final, there is very high bar for adding fixes to it, uh, maybe it's almost impossible. And so what I did is that I found this library that's called Harmony, Harmony Lib. And what this allows you to do is to take any method and replace it with some other method. So what I just did is that if you remember this trace line, I used reflection to get to the debugger and get to this trace line method. And then I replaced it with my own implementation that just does the same thing as this callback. So let's have a look on how that looks like. So this is the piece of code. We create a new harmony and using reflection, the non-public and instance flags, we grab the context. Then from that, we grab the debugger. From that, we grab the trace line method. And uh, then we have this what's called a prefix. So that's a term coming from the harmony and uh, a prefix is a method that's called before the actual method would be called. And if a prefix returns false, the actual method is not called at all. So instead of tracing to the screen, I'm just calling this trace line that I created and then don't call the actual trace line. So this way I am able to hook up my own behavior to the trace lining, but actually don't write to the debug output. So the implementation is super, super simple. We just grab a timestamp. If we have a previous hit, then we calculate the duration and uh, then we assign to the previous hit and then we put it into a collection of hits. And then finally, we return false because we don't want the trace line to be called. So now again, another module, which uh, is here, which is very simple internally. We just do the same thing as we did in the other, other modules. We somehow hook up to the behavior we enable debugging. In this case, we also enable a trace because we are replacing the trace method. We invoke the script block, and then when we are done, we clean up. And then here, I'm just iterating through the whole array to give you another array so you don't give a live reference to my static, um, static collection. And so then we can try the same thing as we did before. So. Now I just did it wrong. It will blow up because we need to switch into PowerShell 5.1. So here in PowerShell 5.1, we call basically the same code as we did before. So we import the tracer for PowerShell 5. We import the same module as we did before, the PS profiler number two. And then we call this trace script PowerShell 5 that we just went over. We invoke the hello PS1. And then again, because this has a slightly different object, even though I wrote both of them, um, we translate it to the standardized shape. And then we can again, as we did before, look at all the files that were in that run. And we can also look at the overview of that actual file. So here we wanted to look at hello, but I indexed it wrong. So this should be two again. Let's look at it again. So this is the actual hello file. We can again confirm that this took over one second so we are measuring the time correctly. And then we still have uh, the top 10 profiles because remember the module that's doing the summarization is always the same. So we again can see that 
This is still the slowest thing to execute that contributes the most to the slowness of the script. And then we have those two, which are also ranking pretty high. So this is usable in PowerShell version five. And I just want to prove it uh, that we are actually running it. And this is unmodified version of the PowerShell because I don't have any power over PowerShell 5.1. So now going forward, at the start, I said that I actually want to profile faster tests. And so I did that and I need to switch back to my PowerShell because this is using the PS tracer, which is using the modified version of PowerShell 7 or PowerShell 6. And so I call this and then I invoke the mock script of Pester itself. I just used it as an example because it's a complicated enough um, to break if you do something wrong. So if this passes, I have quite a lot of confidence that a lot of other tests will also pass and they are not affected by actually being traced. So this is running, it collected quite a lot of events, a lot more than before because before we had like 6,000 events, now we have 276,000 events. So the processing took a bunch, takes a bunch of time because the get profile is very ineffectively implemented. And we can immediately see that we have something very weird at the top. So this line, which is just an opening curly brace of uh, a hash table, is actually taking most of the time to execute and it's hit a lot of times. So let's investigate that. So the cool thing is that we are actually capturing like a lot of information about what's being invoked. So we can look at the top hits and I'm not going to rerun it again, but we can look at the top 10 hits and we can grab the first one. So that will be index zero. And then we have all of the hits, like all the, or each of the hits, each of the executions of that actual command, we have associated with that. So that's the timeline that I was talking about before, but I rather call it hits because it seems more intuitive because the timeline for me is all of the traces at, uh, in the main collection. And so we should see the hits. We should see there is 214 of them. So that's the hit count. And then because I told you there is this index. So index points exactly inside of the whole timeline, inside of the trace. Um, and we can grab that single hit from there. So if we go one step before that, we can see who actually called us. And in this case, that's super useful because we don't know what this is. We want to know where it came from. And so we can see that um, this is being called from something that's related to get PS drive. And if we look at the top item again, so that would be Doro profiles top 10. We take the first item and this time we print it as a list. We can see that this is actually coming from PowerShell Wing Core Debug PowerShell Security PSD. So something that's totally unrelated and unexpected in our code. And we can see that it's being triggered by a get PS drive. But maybe this is not enough. Maybe we don't have enough information from just this one previous call. So how do we get more? How do we get uh, what would be kind of a stack trace or call stack, even though it's not exactly the same thing, but how to see where this call originated from with more information. So to do that, we just need to rewind a bit more in the trace. 
And so here I'm printing all the 10 calls that were leading to this, to this actual thing. And uh, selected the wrong hit. This should indeed instead be the zero. And so I can see that this was called from test registry. And this was called from test drive. So I immediately have more information about how am I getting to this call that's so expensive and maybe it helps me figure out how to solve it and how to get rid of that actual call. The last thing that I wanted to show is that this profiling can also be used for code coverage in Pester. Code coverage in Pester will tell you which of your commands or functions are being covered by your tests. And if you think about it, then code coverage is basically just knowing if the command run at least once. So that's exactly the information that we get from the profiler. So to do that or to show it in action, I'm running this Pester test and it finishes very quickly. You can see that we have a trace and then we are listing all the files that were involved in that run that are not Pester files. So I'm not in, interested in the files that are coming from Pester. We can see that we have some noise, but on the top we have this temp ffps one and f.tests.ps1. So the f file looks like this. It has this function a and it has if true then hello, so this will always run. And then it has this function b which just prints greetings. Then the tests, they look like this. So they just dot source the file and uh, then we are writing a test only for the function A and we only uh, write the test for the upper part of the if branch. So if we then look at the actual profile, we can see that what's in the test is reflected in the profile. So from the A function, only this portion has run. So we can see that the hit counts are here, but no hit counts around here. And then the function B didn't run at all. So there are no hit counts around here. So this will show us if we translate it correctly to the code coverage format, that this wasn't covered and this part also wasn't covered. So if you saw how fast it ran, um, this is nothing to compare to the overhead that we actually get from the breakpoints where the amount of time taken to run the code that's being instrumented with the breakpoints is usually about 10 times or maybe 15 times more than it would normally run. So with that, um, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to show you. So to summarize, there is a work in progress on a command and a module that would allow instrumenting your PowerShell code. This will allow you to look at the performance of your script without jumping through a bunch of hoops. And uh, the native part, the measure, command, uh, measure script that's built into PowerShell should be coming somewhere around January 2021 in PowerShell 7.2 Preview 1, probably behind an experimental flag. And the hacky version for PowerShell 5 that I wrote, I think I will publish it pretty soon. I will first just discuss with Matthias if we should merge it with his module or if we should first publish it separately, but it should be available soon. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, get in touch.